I feel like I'm with family now. I mean, we've had so many yeah. wonderful shirim together. We are. We are really all one family. And when I receive a message from you that we're going to have another shiur and talk together, I'm so happy. I recognize the faces and I see we've really become close. So this is one of the pluses from Corona. And I want to especially say thank you to the young children who are on. You know who I'm talking about. Yes, you are there. Yeah. <laughs> I always hear from you before. It means so much to me. It's very, gorgeous. very special. Gorgeous. We're speaking today about our mission in this world, in this life. Every morning we wake up and the first words we are supposed to say is, we all know, moda'ani. Not modimanachnu, all of us, but moda'ani. It's a personal personal tefillah, personal prayer, where we say, thank you, Hashem. Mode, grateful, ani, am I. My question that I was thinking about as I woke up the other day and I said, moda, ani, is who is ani? Who am I? I mean, especially today in this life of ours where everything seems so upside down, we never know what the day brings. We never know what the week brings. You know, for children who are in school, for parents who are handling that, for grandparents, friends, family, we never know. And in the process, it's easy to lose ourselves because there are so many emotions that we are feeling. Some of us are feeling anxious. Some of us are feeling sad. Some of us are feeling worried. Some of us don't know, you know, what the day holds, what tomorrow holds. Who is the Ani? What's my mission when the world seems so upside down? Things that I took so for granted to be sure and certain, I can't count on that today. But in all this of our world going upside down, I must know Ani, I must know who I am. I must know what my mission is in this world. So how do we figure that out together? Because we always have to live with mission. When Hashem, when God first speaks to Moshe, to Moses, when Hashem first speaks to Avraham Avinu, to our father Abraham, Hashem says, Avram, Avraham, two times, Moshe, Moshe. Why does God give the name twice? So first we know because when you love somebody, you say their name and Hashem loves us so much. Hashem loves Abraham and Moshe so much that Hashem wants to say it twice. But even deeper than that, we come into this world with one name and then we leave this world after 120 years with another name. And what do I mean by that? Our name, our shame is connected to our soul because the word for soul, nishama, has the root of the word shame, which is name. When I come into this world, when you come into this world, we come in with tremendous gifts and blessings and potential. Every day, every minute of the day, every year that we have is such a gift. Everyone listening today has another gift to give this world. Every Shabbos that comes, every shiur, every talk, every Torah class that we take, every person that God puts into our life becomes a potential for blessing and for doing something great. So that's how we come into this world. That's the first name. But then the second name is exactly what do we accomplish with all the time that we are here with? What have we done with our lives? It can either be a source of pain and shame or a source of tremendous blessing and joy. After 120 years, when we see a movie of our life, and we see everything that we have, the potential of who we could be, and the mission that we have versus what we've accomplished. That becomes the test of my life. That becomes my mission, my potential. So how do we uphold the potential that we have, especially now during this time of Corona? And you know what? David HaMelech, King David, said it so beautifully. He said it in Tehillim. He says it in Psalms. Lo amus, I will not die. Ki echya, but I am going to live. But if you don't die, don't you live? Here's the secret to life, the secret to mission that David HaMelech, that King David is giving us. Lo amus, I will not die. You see, you can live in two ways. You can either live by not dying 
So you're alive because you haven't died. Or you could live by living, by making the most of every single day, by every single day touching somebody. You know what you have to ask yourself at the end of the day? This is what I ask myself. Whose eyes did I make sparkle today? Whose eyes shine because I am here? That's it. If I can think of one person whose eyes shine, whose eyes sparkle because I'm here, then I have fulfilled my mission of today. If I've learned one thing, if I've done one thing, one chesed, one kindness, said one prayer with my heart, made this world better because I am here, then I have fulfilled my mission. So how do we do all this? Where do we begin? You know that my mother taught me this, and I want to repeat this to you because in every shir, my mother said this, which means turn the pages, turn the pages. Everything is here. Everything is in the Torah. If we want to know about our mission, let's go back to the Torah because the Torah gives us the clue and the wisdom for life that is immutable and never changes. So number one, when it comes to our mission in our life, the first key to fulfilling our potential is give life. Give life. And what do I mean by that? Journey with me right now back to Egypt, the first greatest and most awful lockdown in the history of Am Yisrael, of our Jewish people. Now, amazingly enough, if we want to know if something is true or not, we have to go back into the Torah and see what is the word for this in the Torah. So what is the word for history in the Torah? There is no word for history in the Torah. Do you know how you say history in Hebrew? History, yeah. It's not a real word. It's a made up word. We don't have a history. Do you know what we have? We have a sipur. We have a story. Kol hamarbe lesaper b'etzias mitzrayim, we say by the Seder. Everybody who tells more and more the story of leaving Egypt, that's the mitzvah. We don't speak about history. We speak about our story because our story continues for every single generation. The story of Egypt, that's our story today. Let's go back there. Let's figure it out. What gave the Jewish people life? What gave them hope? What gave them purpose? What gave them mission? So there were two women, two famous women who lived in Egypt. What were their names? Shifra and Pua. What does it mean to be a heroine? What does it mean to be a great woman? Torah is going to tell us right now. These two women were told by Paro, by Pharaoh, that every Jewish boy should be killed because they were the midwives. Now the word Paro, if you take the letters of Pharaoh, it spells pe ra an evil mouth. In every generation, there is a mouth that speaks evil. What does that mean? It's a mouth that brings you down, a mouth that saps you of your strength, of your hope, of your survival. We cannot allow anyone's mouth to take away our hope and our faith. So these two women, they were called miyaldot, they were called midwives because they gave life. This becomes the mission of every single Jewish woman. Mitzrayim Egypt is not just Egypt from thousands of years ago. It comes from the word tsar, which is narrow. Whenever we feel that we are in a narrow place in our lives, whether it's corona, whether it's a health issue, whether it's a shalom bias issue, peace in the home, any issue that a person has, a financial issue, an emotional issue, something that's hurting your heart, that's called Mitzrayim, that's called Egypt. And each of us has the power and potential to be a midwife, to be somebody who gives life. So how do we do that? We have Shifra and Pua, these two women. Why were they called Shifra and Pua? Shifra, because she was Misha Peret et Havalad. She made the baby very beautiful. Pua, because she would say, Poo Poo, she would calm the baby and she would calm the mother. What does that mean? What were their real names? You know what the real names were? These were the mother and the 
sister of Moses, of Moshe. This was Yocheved and Miriam, but the Torah doesn't call them Yocheved and Miriam because your name is your mission. And do you know what their mission was? To make a child and a mother feel beautiful? To make a child and a mother feel calm and comfortable through words. What does that mean? Truly, they should have been called bracha, blessing, chaya, life, because they gave blessing, they gave life. The fact that the Torah calls them shifra because she made a baby beautiful, she made a mother feel beautiful, pua because she said poo poo, is that what it means to be a heroine in life? So listen carefully, my friends. What does it mean to make somebody feel beautiful? It doesn't mean that you say, oh, you look so beautiful. Your dress is so beautiful. I love your outfit. I love the way you decorate it. That's not making somebody feel beautiful. Do you know how you make somebody feel beautiful? You make a person feel that they are alive. You make them feel that you cherish them, that you value them. I was speaking the other day to a grandmother and she told me, I feel completely irrelevant. I feel forgotten. I sit here and I'm waiting for somebody to call me, somebody to say hello, somebody to say, I miss you. And one day goes into the next, into the next, into the next. That woman doesn't feel beautiful because she doesn't feel alive. Do you know what our mission is right now, each of us? To be a shifra, to be a pua, to give life. The Torah says, but that they gave life. How? By making somebody that you know feel alive, calling up a grandmother, calling up a daughter, calling up a sister, a friend, a neighbor, somebody that you know to say, how are you? I miss you. If you know that somebody's down, to say, I'm davening for you. Do you know what that does for somebody? Pua means that you give somebody a word of calm because there's so much hype going around. That's paro, para, where there's so much in the news that brings people down. Everybody forwards these WhatsApps and you're on these chats and there's so much negativity in the world, but that brings everybody down. We have to fight that. And how do we do that? By giving birth, by helping people give birth to hope because it's the Jewish women who helped the Jewish people get out of Egypt. And we're told that it's the Jewish women who will help us get out of this final exile. We are at the last stop. And do you know how we get out of this? By not allowing para, not allowing evil mouth, meaning somebody to take away your hope, gossip, cruelty, unkindness, forwarding, different texts and WhatsApps that aren't nice and kind. Be a source of life, be a source of hope. That becomes our mission. Every one of us has the potential to do that. Just to tell somebody, to call them up and say, I am davening for you. I'm going to share something personal now. When I was first a young bride and I had gotten married, my husband was traveling and I, I had my first appointment because I was expecting a baby. And because my husband was traveling, my mother came with me to the doctor. And I was so excited, you know, first baby, first appointment, there we were. And the doctor said to me at the time, is there anything you'd like to ask me? I said to the doctor, yes, I, I don't know. I just, I feel something in my neck. It feels like a, a pee. And so the doctor felt it and he said, you know, I'll speak to you and your mom in the office. So I go afterwards to the office, I'm with my mother and his face grows very serious. The doctor says, everything is okay, but I just called a colleague of mine. He's a surgeon, an oncologist, and I want you to go straight there. You have a lump in your neck. Honestly, I thought I'd collapse. So my mother and I, we first called my Zaidi and mama, my grandmother for a bracha, for a blessing. And we went to the doctor and the surgeon examines me and he says, I'm putting you in for surgery in two days. We have two days. And I said, I mean, can't it be something else? Is there any blood test you could take? He said, I highly doubt that, you know, I've examined you. I'll, I'll do blood work, but 
you know, you're scheduled. I said, what about the baby? He said, right now, we're not talking about a baby. Right now, we're talking about your life. I remember going home and going to sleep and waking up like every 15, 20 minutes thinking I had a terrible nightmare and then realizing it wasn't a nightmare. This is real. So a day later, I remember I, I was, I remember like it was yesterday, I was visiting with my grandparents, getting a, a bracha, a blessing from them. And my mother called and she said that the doctor just called her to say that I have mono. It's a swollen gland. Oh, Baruch Hashem. But the doctor said he'd like me to see a hematologist. So next stop is the hematologist. And the hematologist says to me, I am removing myself from this case. This is a virus. You're in the first trimester. There is nothing that I can tell you that is for sure or good. And I will not take this case on. I can tell you that for the next nine months, every single morning, every single afternoon, every single evening, at least three times a day, I would call my mother, I would call my father, and I'd say, I'm so frightened. And I remember my mother saying, Shefala, I am davening for you. Not only am I davening for you, but I'm going to call Zayda now, and Zayda is also going to daven for you. You are not alone. You are not alone. We are davening for you. I remember feeling as if such a burden was lifted from my shoulders. And then when I felt the burden again, I would pick up the phone. And again, my mother would say, Shefala, I am davening for you. And Zaid is davening for you. My mother told me that there was a point when she was a young mommy and she was expecting and, and she was worried about different things. She actually called her Zaidi, my great grandfather, who somehow survived the Holocaust, but lost his entire family, his wife and his children. But he survived. My great-grandfather, who we called Zayda Einstein, I remember him. And my mother described how she would call him in tears and say, Zayda, can you daven for me? And my great-grandfather would say to my mother, Yedin Shmona Esrei, which in Yiddish means every Shmona Esrei, every day when I daven, I have in Zin, I have in mind, Esther Bas Miriam. That was my mother's name. And my mother said to me, I'm going to tell you the same thing. Yede Shmona Esrei. Every Shmona Esrei. I am davening. Slava Chan Bas Esther. It gave me life. It gave me life. I can tell you that it's one of the things, one of the things that I miss so much from having my parents, from having my grandparents, from having my mother around, just to have somebody say to me, Yedin Shmone Esrei, every Shmone Esrei I daven for you. That's how we give life. If you could think of somebody to call, to text, to say, I'm davening for you. I'm thinking of you. I value you, your friendship, your love, your smile. It's going to be okay to be a shifra, to make somebody feel beautiful, to be a pua, to give somebody that calm. It's going to be okay. We're going to make it through this. Then we have fulfilled purpose and mission in this world. Lo emos, I will not die. Ki yechye, but I am going to live. And do you know how we live? By giving life to others. Because when we give to others, do you know who we truly give to? We give to ourselves. But, and here is a huge, huge but, I cannot love another if I don't first love myself. Not in a selfish way, but in a beautiful way. The Yetzir Hara, that voice, that inclination inside, that negative voice brings us down by saying, oh, please, what can you do? What can you accomplish? What do you know? Do you know what you've done in your world? You've, you've made so many mistakes. And what do you know anyway? And what have you studied anyway? That voice brings us down. If I want to value others, I must first value myself. If I want to live 
a life where I don't judge others negatively, then I first must not judge myself negatively. And we have a way, women especially, of underestimating our potential, our strength, our faith, what we can do, what we can accomplish. If we would only realize what every single prayer accomplishes, what every tefillah does, what every tehillim that we say does, one more chapter, one more verse, even to say, I Hashem, do you know that that's a prayer? Every time a woman says, I Hashem, that's a prayer. So if I can just have my intention, my kavana to know that I count, my words count, my actions count, number one, first key to fulfilling our mission in this world, no matter what the world is going through, to know that I am a midwife, just like in Egypt, I give birth. How do I give birth? I give birth by giving life, by making people feel alive, by helping people know that they count, that they matter to me, that they are beautiful. This is number one, to be a source of only good words in this world and not negativity, to keep hope alive, because as long as there is hope, there is life. That's number one. Number two, when it comes to mission, we can never allow anybody to clip our wings, to take our vision away, to minimize who we are and what we can accomplish. And we go back to the Torah again, back to Tanakh, because that's where the greatest wisdom is. There was a woman, and we, maybe we all know the story, but we have to think about it. There was a woman and her name was Hannah. And Hannah could not have any children. She was married to a wonderful man whose name was Elkanah. She cried because she couldn't have children. She wanted to have a child so badly. One day, Elkanah, her husband, looked at her and said, Hannah, my Hannah, my Hannah, why are you crying? Aren't I better to you than just having a house full of children? I love you. Our house is filled with love. Let it go. Let it go. Isn't it better that you have me? I'm here. I'm with you. It's okay. And the moment that Hannah saw that her husband had given up on prayer, that was the moment that she gave out a bitter cry. And she said, you know what? If my husband has given up on prayer and I see he's not going to pray anymore, there's only one person left who will keep my hope alive. And you know who that person is? It's me. Because there's no one else in the world who's going to daven, who's going to pray for me. It's all on me. So Hannah decided to take a trip. And she went to the Mishkan. She went to the tabernacle, to Shiloh. She poured her heart out. Her mission was to just pray with all her heart until she opens up the gates of heaven above. And Ailey, who was the Kohen, who was the priest, saw this woman just cry and mumble under her breath, whispering words, tears coming down. And do you know what Ailey thought? Ailey, the priest, thought that Hannah was drunk. So he turns to her and he says to her, how dare you? How dare you come into this holy place as a drunk woman? Stop with this drinking of the wine. Pull yourself together. And Hannah at that moment, instead of just leaving and saying, oh my gosh, what does he think I am? Who does he think he is? Leaving insulted or hurt, she turned to Ailey and she said, no, lo Adoni, no, 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 no. Kimarat ruach anochi, because I have a bitter spirit inside of me. My heart is so heavy. I'm here because I can't have a child and I'm here to daven. I'm here to pray. This is my mission in the world. I'm not drunk. My heart is breaking. And when Eli saw this, he felt so terrible. He said, I give you a blessing. 
that you will return here and you will be the mother of a child. And we learn from this, that when we misjudge a person, do you know how we rectify our misjudging a person and our hurting a person? We give the person a blessing. So Ailey gave a blessing and guess what? Chana conceived and she had a little boy whose name was Shmuel who became a prophet. Chana actually taught us how to pray. Her mission was to pray and she would not let anybody strip her of her mission in this world. Nobody could take the breath of life away from her. She was focused on her mission. When you have a mission in this world, when you have a vision, when you know that you want to do something, don't let anybody minimize you. Don't let anybody make you feel as if you will never accomplish that. Don't let anybody say, oh, please, what are you, a Rebbitzin? What are you going to do? What do you think you could accomplish? You're just one person. You don't have to save a village in Africa to be great. We learn from Shifra and Pua. Choose one aspect, one key, one part of your mission that you want to do in this world. Maybe it's calling somebody every day to say, I'm thinking of you. That's giving life. Maybe it's not losing your temper. Maybe it's taking, saying one psalm every single day. Whatever it is that you decide, maybe it's taking Shabbos on 10 minutes early and saying, Hashem, I love Shabbos so much. I'm going to think about my Shabbos right now. And I'm going to guard Shabbos. And the same way that I guard Shabbos and take it on 10 minutes early, I'm asking that you guard me and watch over me. Whatever mitzvah you do, don't let anybody tell you that it's impossible. Let's learn from Chana. Let's not judge ourselves negatively and let's not judge other people negatively. You know, there was a little girl I know and she was a little bit messy. Her knapsack was filled with squished raisins and squished apple juice box drinks at the bottoms and, and, and squished potato chips. So her teacher gave her a little bit of admonishment. And this little girl called me up with her mommy. And she said, you know, my teacher thinks I'm just a mess. So I said, you know what, how about this week, we're going to work together. And when you're going to go to school, every night, the night before, you're going to, with your mommy, you're going to clean out your knapsack. You're going to make sure you have all your books, all your crayons, all your pens, all your magic markers. Everything's going to be set. And by the end of the week, your teacher's going to see you in a completely different light because you're going to work so hard. And I want you to call me by the end of the week. So the end of the week, sure enough, this little girl calls me and I say to her, so what did your Mora say? What did your teacher say? And she said, my Mora said nothing because she thought that I was still the girl from last week. And that broke my heart. How often in life do we have people who are trying to make little steps, little changes, little bits and pieces, little effort to just be better, to live better, to be kinder but we already judge that person and we don't allow them to grow. So the Torah is telling us, if you have a mission in this world, don't let somebody take that vision of you away. Stand up for your prayer, stand up for your amuna, stand up for your belief and know that you have tremendous, tremendous potential in this world. When God created the world, when Hashem created the world, it says, Asher bara Elohim lasos, that God created the world to do. Do you know what that means? Why did God create you? Why did God create me? Not just to be a creation in this world, but to do. And just like in the physical world, if you have a muscle and you don't use the muscle, the muscle atrophies. If somebody, God forbid, let's say breaks an arm or breaks a leg, you know that when you take the cast off, the arm or the leg is so little 
because it shriveled, it wasn't used and you have to work again to get strength in that muscle. It's the same way in our spiritual world, in our spiritual muscle. If you don't use a spiritual muscle, it atrophies, it shrivels, it shrinks. So we have to use our nishamas, we have to use our souls, we have to use our minds, we have to use our hearts to constantly keep growing. And we cannot allow a lockdown or a quarantine or a corona to become spiritually malnourished. We have to feed our nishamas, we have to feed our souls, and we have to keep on going with mission and purpose and emuna and faith. And we cannot discount who we are and the potential that we have to accomplish greatness in this world. That's number two. And finally, when it comes to number three, when it comes to mission, we have to know lech lecha, which means go for yourself. When it comes to creating and living with mission, we don't just go randomly in this world. But Hashem, God said to Abraham, to Avraham, lech go lecha for yourself. You write your story. It's true, there are certain things that are out of our control. And don't we know that now? Isn't that something that we've learned? But there's so much that is in our control. Our reaction to life is in our control. How we react to the people in our lives is in our control. How we forgive, how we apologize, how we speak, how we see things. All that's in our control. The thoughts in my mind, that's in my control. The emotions in my heart, that's in my control. So I have to, lech lecha, I have to write my own story. Everybody now is going under tremendous stress, tremendous pressure. When we look back at this time, we're going to ask ourselves, how did we act and how did we react? Will we be proud of ourselves? Well, we say we strengthened ourselves, we dug deep, because this is what Mesiris Nefesh means. This is what it means to sacrifice, to find out what does faith really mean. All along, any shiur, any class that you've taken, any study that you've had, any Shabbos lights that you've brought into your home, this was all practice for the marathon. We are running a marathon right now. And sometimes we'll be out of breath and sometimes we're going to fall, but we have to pick ourselves up and know that this is, this is it. This is our marathon for life because we all know that the word for test is nisayon. But the root of that word, and here comes the beauty of Lashon Kodesh, the beauty of Judaism and the holy tongue, because this is from Hashem himself, is nase, which means miracle, and banner. Do you know what a miracle is? Have you seen miracles in your lifetime? Of course you have. Just being on this screen now that we have women from all over the world connecting to study Torah together is a miracle. To get through the day when there is so much hardship and difficulty and still have a smile on our face, to be able to say Shema tonight, to say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, to be able to stand with faith, to be that woman thousands of years later from the women who were in Egypt and still be able to say the same Shema, to light the same Shabbos candles, to make the same blessings, to believe in the same Hashem Echad, or Shemo Echad, that's a miracle. And if I can get through this, if you can get through this with our feet on the ground, then that's our banner. And nobody can ever take your banner away from you. I wrote about this recently on my article on age.com and I received such a beautiful email from a woman. She said that after reading it, she created a banner to keep over her bed and she colored with magic marker all the different great emotions and tests that she feels she has passed throughout this time of Corona, everything that she has done, everything that she has seen, everything that she has gone through, it became the most beautiful banner. I asked her just to send me a photo of it. You can't imagine. Imagine every night going to sleep and looking up above your bed and seeing behind you this banner, this colorful banner of all the greatness that you have achieved to remember, because this is what faith is. 
This is what a banner is. This is what a nisayon is. It's not just a challenge. It's not just a test. It's a banner of who I am. This is my mission in this world. This is what it's all about. So if you take a pot of boiling water, and this also I'd like to say is a wisdom from my mother. It should be a zechus. It should be a merit for the neshama of Esther, Bas, Harav, Avram, Halevi. If you take a pot of boiling water and you choose three foods to put into the pot, let's say you put in an egg, a potato, and some coffee. Okay, so what happens? You put the egg in and the egg is boiling, the egg is boiling, what do you get? You get a hard boiled egg. You get an egg with a hard shell and inside it's soft. There's a potato, you put in the potato, it's boiling and boiling and boiling and you get a mushy potato in a lot of pieces. Or you take the coffee and you take the granules and you put it in and afterwards, you can add a little bit of sugar, a little bit of Splenda, a little bit of cream, and you have a delicious, delicious drink that you walk around with. What's the lesson for life? Everybody in the world right now is going through a pot of boiling water in different ways. For some, it's because the house seems too full. For some, it's because the house seems too empty. For some, it's Parnassa, it's finances that are just going up in smoke and this fear. For some, it's the fear of what will be. Everybody has a different worry, a different stress. And it's not an Olympics of worry. It's not an Olympics of suffering. For each person, their fear and their worry is the most important thing in the world. And we have to understand that. For each person, their challenge is the greatest challenge that they are facing. It's a pot of boiling water. Now, we have no choice about a lot of things, but I'll tell you what we do have a choice about. How am I going to get through this? I can either be the egg, and that means that I have a very hard shell. I'm in that pot of water. Maybe inside I know I have a soft spot. I have a neshama. I have a soul. But outside, don't start with me. Don't mess with me. And I'm very short. I'm very, you know, I have a temper. I'm bitter. And everybody knows, don't start with this person when they get that face. From the time I wake up in the morning to the time I go to sleep at night, I'm curt, I'm short, I have a shell. It's, it's become hard. That's one reaction. Number two, what's number two? I can be like a potato. What does that mean? It means I become mush. Hashem, I can't, I can't, I just can't anymore. One more person asks me something, one more phone rings, one more text, one more email, I, I, I'm going to collapse, God forbid. That's number two. Number three, I can take the coffee. Now, if you take coffee granules by themselves, it's bitter. Yuck. Who wants, who wants to just eat coffee granules on your tongue? Terrible. But you put it in the boiling water, and then you add a little bit of sugar. You add a little bit of cream, however you like it. And you know what? You've taken the bitter granules and you've made it into something so sweet, so delicious, so delicious. So what we do is we take our challenge and we ask ourselves, am I becoming an egg? Am I becoming a mushy potato? Or am I becoming a delicious coffee where I am learning not to take for granted all the blessings of my life where I see the banner behind me and I say, I'm going to make it. We're going to make it. I'm going to be a Shifra. I'm going to be a Pua. I'm going to give life. I'm going to give calm. I'm going to make beauty in this world. I'm going to make a difference in this world. There's nobody who's going to take my vision, my dream, my potential, my shlichus, my mission away from me. Loamus, I will not die. Ki but I'm going to live. How? Lech lecha. I'm going to walk, but not just walk endlessly, mindlessly. Lecha, for myself. There's greatness that's going to come out of this. So I'd like to end with this thought. If anyone is thinking now, sounds good, but what can I possibly do? What could my mission be? It was just my father's yard site this past week. So I'd like to give this story over. Le'ilu nishmas for the neshama of my dear, dear father. 
Harav Meshulam ben Harav Asharanchal the Neshama, the soul should have an aliyah, the soul should go higher and higher. If we think about mission and purpose, so when my father was in the hospital, and we could think to ourselves, what could a person do in the hospital? My father was so ill. So every day we'd go for a walk. One of us children or grandchildren would be there. I remember holding my father's hand and we would go for a walk around the hall very, very slowly. My father was in so much pain. So think about it. A man, a woman could think to themselves, what can I accomplish like this? I'm not feeling good in the hospital, weak. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. What, what can I possibly do? Next door to my father's room was a man. And he was known to be a little bit like, shall we say, crabby. I think you have that word also in England, right? Crabby. Everybody was afraid to go into this man's room. You know, you went in and the words that he gave were very sharp. One word, answers, replies. The nurses were afraid to go in there. Nobody wanted to go in there. My father would stick his head in every day and he'd say, hello. My father knew that he was a Jew. But this man insisted every time my father would come in and say, hello. And Shalom Aleichem, my father would say. He'd say, I'm a Buddhist. I don't know what you're talking about, Rabbi. I'm a Buddhist. But my father wouldn't take this Buddhist to be the final answer. And my father would still go in every single day. One day, my father went in. And my father said to him, listen, I know you say you're a Buddhist, but you have to have a Jewish name. What was your Jewish name? What's your Jewish name? And the man said, eh, I don't know. I don't remember. But my father wouldn't give up. Even in all his pain, my father said to this man, listen, you must have had a bubby. What did your bubby call you? And then the man's eyes filled with tears. And he said, oh, my bubby, my bubby would call me Fievel. Fievel, my father said. How could a Fievel be a Buddhist? And the man began to cry. And my father took him, even though my father had an IV, took him into his arms. And he said again, how could a Fievel be a Buddhist? From that day on, Fievel and my father became best of friends. One day, Fievel came to visit my father. And he didn't look good. My father said to him, Fievel, what's the matter? And Fievel said, Rabbi, the doctor said that I have to go home. There's nothing more they can do for me. Rabbi, I'm so frightened. Will you testify for me when I go up to the heavens above that I was a good Jew, that at the end of my days, I said the Shema every morning, and every night that I remembered my Jewish name, that I was Fievel, that I remembered that I was a Jew. Of course, my father said, and let's say the Shema now together. And that was the last meeting that my father had with Fievel, where they said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Fievel, my father said, I will testify for you in the heavens above that you lived and you left this world as a Jew. You lived your mission. And at the end of the day, this is what it comes down to. No matter who we are, no matter where we are, we have the power, especially as women, to hold on to hope, to give life, to give beauty, to give faith, to never allow somebody to take our mission away. Lech lecha, journey for yourself. And when you journey for yourself, know that you journey for the Jewish people. Because when there is unity, there is strength. And we are the women who keep hope alive, who keep emuna alive. I thank you so much for being here, for taking the time. What a beautiful crowd we've had. 
and I thank you all for your chat notes. It means so, so much to me. I dab and I pray that Hashem gives us all quickly, refuah, healing, Yeshua, salvation, and we should all be able to meet and dance in Yerushalayim, and we'll say to each other, I just saw you on the chat, and here we are dancing together in Yerushalayim. Thank you so much for inviting me.